ordering of the thoughts. And there's no merit in becoming detached from form. I mean, you really, you really can't. You can't really become detached from form. You can only become detached from ordering thoughts. And then it may appear that there's no attachment to form. Mm-hmm. So then how do you become? How do you become detached from the ordering of thoughts? So that it sounds like that's the next question to address. I think it's um starting to notice where the ordering is going on, that I am ordering, and just to start to question and examine the ordering, and and does it serve me? And with the, the, the looking at the metaphysical underpinnings of that, and recognizing through that, that it's, it, it doesn't bring me what I want it to bring me and what I thought it was bringing me. You know, I thought it was bringing me peace and joy and happiness and salvation, but actually the judgment, the ordering of thoughts brings me nothing but pain and misery and hurt. I think you, you were starting to address a couple of different times today, getting down to the deeper levels of purpose and use, and I feels like that's real appropriate here. Yeah. And uh, also to piggyback on what you were just saying about this ordering of thoughts, and the mind has a choice, and that is to forgive or to judge. It really is that simple. As Beverly was just saying, to the deceived mind, the judgment seems to offer something. Because if I fail to forgive, I need to put my faith in something. And judgment the ego continually is saying in there, judgment brings you something. It's brought you nice things. You've, you've learned. You've been educated. That's what your whole education and maturity in life, to become a mature adult, is to become better and better with your judgment. So you know the things to pursue and the things to avoid. So it really seems to have brought something of value. And we're starting to get to the point where, as everyone was saying, it has not brought an brought anything except pain and misery, even though it has seemed to bring some things. The deceived mind in, in its, you know, desperate attempt to bring order and organization to the chaos resorts to this whole system of ordering thoughts. And according to that, then it wants everything that it sees to fit very neatly into the boxes, the definitions, the pictures that it has made up to try to keep things in some kind of manageable system. And so when, when things seem to be fitting in those neat little boxes, then it seems like life is a bowl of cherries. But, yeah, and then maybe it'll get boring, but and when it doesn't seem like things are pit- fitting into these boxes, these pictures, these definitions that are to my liking, that's when, you know, it's bad news. Or at least, it's, the very least, disorienting is what I, right. I sense Mary saying. She's feeling very disoriented mm-hmm. because she's starting to question the boxes. Mm-hmm. And the and forgiveness really is to, to recognize that these boxes that I have made up are not real. It's not the truth. It's something I have made up. That's all, you know? And when I can start really looking at, you know, different uh, boxes, different concepts, different definitions that I hold and recognizing that I made them up. And I made up a whole system to support it in the sense that, you know, I made it up so that everybody I know agrees with me on it. You know, it's very convincing the way I've constructed this whole thing. Yeah. Right. The thing yeah. about too forgiveness, you know, complete forgiveness is the atonement, and the atonement is a total commitment. That is very, very frightening and fearful to the deceived mind. Just think of of the things I know when I first was getting ready to commit to going to college. 
commitment with a relationship. Marriage. I mean, that's quite a thing. You've heard all the stories of people getting cold feet and all the nausea and everything on the day of the wedding. Just thinking of the thoughts. What am I committing to here? What with these vows till death do we part? What if you know, on and on and on. And those are are just in a sense, till death do we part. You can see they're all commitments that involve time and linearity and so on and so forth. And the, the atonement is a total commitment. And it seems to the deep mind that to accept the atonement, obviously, it senses that it's a, it's a total mind overhaul. It is a complete, absolute overhaul of every thought and belief. And it, to the deceived mind, it just seems easier. Total commitment, complete mind overhaul, on the one hand, judgment on the other hell everybody else everybody else judges it seems easier to, to just fall into life is suffering we're coming here we just do the best we can we yes we judge everyone judges there are ups and downs, there are ups and downs. that's what life's all about and then you and die and I know how to judge I mean, I'm pretty good at that you know I'm pretty familiar with that I mean this mind overhaul business how do you do that what's that like who's doing that who do I look to you know where's the handbook Where's the instruction manual on that? Mm-hmm. Well, I think we've got one. <laughs> and here we are with that thing. And, and all of experience in this world has indicated peace, peace is not constant. Pain, conflict, upset and everything. To me, it just gets clearer and clearer. These are the alternatives. The section in the course is the real alternatives. That all of these thoughts and all of these judgments and everything have led me down empty roads. None of them has ever brought me that. As it just gets clearer and clearer and clearer in my mind, then I can see, I can grasp that real alternative. I I look for witnesses in the world to that real alternative in the sense that, that every encounter, I'm not going to pay attention to what the person says, what they do, you know, how they look or whatever. My intention is to be at one with them. And if, if that's my intention and my mind is that powerful, how can it be anything different? It just comes back to that really being clear of purpose and intention. I have to really sort these, have the Holy Spirit sort these two purposes out in my mind. And that's what we do when we come together. We, we spent that one time going into the attraction of guilt which was, you know, I'm sure things got stirred up after that. You know, and, and you've been real candid sharing the things that have come up in dreams, and both of you have had dreams, you know, where things have been happening, that the way things are happening is not good. <laughs> There's an uncomfortable feeling or whatever, but just taking the dream as, a, as an interpretation and starting to look at the beliefs that are below it, that's, that's what we do when we come together. We just start to take a look at the beliefs like that. It seems to intensify, too, as you keep coming together to do it. And that's what, if you really are are in it, so to speak, to go to the end, then, you know, I'm, I'm saying, I'm in it, too, with you, you know. That's, that's all I can say from, from my Mind is that I'm in, I've joined with, with that intention to do that. How many times do we have to go into it? <laughs> I notice I want, it's just like I want it to, I want it to be over with. We just have to go into it until we can see the impossibility of the duality in the world. And when I talk about it as a screen, talking about it as a projection, it, it can just seem hypothetical and, and hairy fairy, but it's like, but the duality, I have to be able to see that the split is in my mind. Okay. I got, I got it, one there. I've been with Zen masters who have meditated all day, all night, who have starved themselves, who have been to the Himalayas and every other mountain cave in the world. And the bottom line is there is no duality. They're very clear except one, 
good and evil. Now, I don't, haven't spent any time like that meditating. I'm sitting here talking a mile a minute. How am I ever going to get to the point of that, Dave? How am I ever? I mean, these are Zen masters. How am I? Who am I to ever get to the point of seeing no duality in this world? How many Course in Miracles conversations are we going to have before I see no duality in the world? When did, I mean, I, that, that totally boggles my mind that I even, I mean, I'm satisfied to just keep meditating and get to, there's good and evil, and that doesn't bring me any peace. I might as well just stay right where I'm at. Well, I would say, too, that very simply, when that's come up in the Course, and I've read what Jesus has to say, he says, ask yourself this question, you know, would God have a plan for my salvation that could fail? Well, good question. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the question that I ask myself if I have a thought, like how am I ever going to, before I let it even go on and on and on, is just, would God have a plan? What if I don't believe in God? Not necessary. Not necessary not to believe in God, but <laughs> this, is, this is bringing a lot of resistance up because that's precisely, I sit in a meditation and in fact, Zen meditation makes sense to me because there is no God, essentially, in it. And I'm not sure that I believe in this God or this Holy Spirit or this Christ. And if I don't believe in that, then how am I ever going to appreciate a statement like, would God ever lead me in a plan that wouldn't work? Okay. The next step is, what about forgiveness? Can you believe in forgiveness? Or, to use more Zen terms, detachment or... Whatever, however you want to word it. See, that's what it, the psychotherapy pamphlet is helpful for me, too, in the sense that it said formal belief in God is, is not essential because God is to be known. God can only be known, and even any kind of a belief in Him, even the most advanced so-called belief, is still a concept. And so he does say in there, though, what about forgiveness, you know? Even if you don't formally believe in, in that, just the idea of forgiveness or of healing or of anything, you know, something like that that seems to have a resonance, you know, that's what I go to if the idea of a, of a God even just seems too iffy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I can see. It's just that when Krista presents something that I've also thought about, how many times am I am I going to be getting together? I can see me, 75. Excuse me, guys, I got my cane. Let's be sitting down. Now, can you go over that again? What does this mean about this, huh? <laughs> and then the next day I croak, and I've been spending a gosh darn, I'm, I'm 42 now, I've been spending 35 more years going over this, creating havoc with my family, havoc with my friends, and havoc with myself. Hey, what, what is it? I think the key factor is willingness. I don't think it has to do with how many times, how many years. No. And I, I say that from the experience of that. I mean, I feel like things have just zoomed right along for me. You know, and, and three years ago, I was, I was feeling like this is an impossible task. And now, I'm sure it's a possible task. I mean, it seems very attainable to me. And, and you know, what you said about how many times, it's like, I guess the thought that came to my mind when you said that was, well, you know, it, till you get it, and it's like, it's reprogramming. You know, when you think of all the thoughts that have uh, reinforced the wrong mind, it's like there, you know, I don't know what the shock treatment would be, as it were, to just erase all that in a flash and be constantly and consistently in the, consistently in the right mind. <laughs> 